I also know as research. Since 1990, wow. I was first time when I listened to him. I was highly impressed. But in the audience, we had only a few people, including myself, Ed, and me, and maybe one or two more people. They thought that this, the, what he was presenting could indeed have a significant impact on the healthcare. All the years he was humble, he was convincing the more and more people. I think he was also revolutionizing the memory related research in the field. He's by training neuroscientist and he was in Pittsburgh until he moved to USC. Uh, he has two uh, national centers and significantly sponsored by the DARPA, NIH, and several multi-center grants. I had the honor and pleasure to serve on his advisor board. He has also companies. His company has been funded by our dear friend Elon Musk and others. Yes. Uh, Elon Musk, as you know, is the owner of the significant contributor to Tesla. And the, there are other entities also, they would like to help the company to turn into something that can be used healthy. So basically, he's going to enhance the memory, like normal people like you, and to have better memory. It's impossible, of course, to return the the memories, old memories back, but I think it's, it's going to be important starting in certain time to enhance it. The memory is always makes you nervous. If you look at the most of the road, <coughs> most we have, everybody remembers all the bad things in the past. Sometimes maybe it's better to have a good start somewhere, to only remember something peaceful, something for all mankind, and just to have uh, from what they feel. So the, that also mentored several, several <coughs> students, to students. When I been lectured almost everywhere in the world except Houston as a uh, several plenary keynote speaker. I think this is the first time he's in Crete. I'm trying to make him also happy. Yes. That's wonderful to see. Thank you. I don't even need to say I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much, Benson. I really appreciate uh, uh, your support and the invitation to accompany you many, many places. Uh, we always have a, a good time together and the, the, we always, Benton always takes us to places where the science is firm. Um, then I want to, uh, I, so thank you, Benton. I want to make sure that I thank the others who helped me this morning. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't intend to, uh, to bleed all over the floor. <laughs> and uh, so I changed the color of the floor a little bit. Hopefully it'll go back. But uh, everyone was very kind and uh, helping me to get to the hospital and get sewn back up um, so that I could be here this afternoon. And I want to thank everyone for their help. Um, so I'm going to tell you about a, uh, developing a, a new kind of prosthesis, uh, a cognitive prosthesis. and. Um, and it's uh, and specifically one one for memory, uh, and it's uh, and with with all kinds of projects like this and with other with respect to other projects that you've heard about before as well, uh, this is very much a team effort. Uh, I don't do this alone. Uh, there are several other groups at different institutions that we and we all have to work together to accomplish this goal. Uh, in our case, the. The modeling work is done by myself and Don Song and Vasilis Morales at uh, USC. Uh, we have uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists that take care of patients that are brought to us for study. Uh, we have a, a large group at Wake Forest that uh, they, they perform similar uh, uh, studies of, of patients uh, and their memory. Uh, and uh, that, that's who's listed here as well. And we have a I have a wonderful colleague at Hong Kong, Ray Chung, who is responsible for developing the hardware implementation that will ultimately uh, bear fruit in the, in the form of a microchip that patients can wear uh, on their head and walk around uh, through the world and, and using this memory enhancing technology. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip a few slides uh, so that I can stay within the the, uh, the time constraints here, uh, but I'm not skipping this one. Uh, the uh, the group, the, these three groups that uh, that I talked about, uh, three or four groups. Uh, again, this is the workflow between us, 
Uh, again, we're, we're pretty much responsible. This is a, a project that I started uh, almost 20 years ago, and uh, we are responsible for the modeling of the data analysis. Uh, Wake Forest, uh, again, they have, this is one uh, stream of patients. Uh, they have, uh, these are uh, all epilepsy patients. So the, the electrode implantation and the patient testing uh, data collection takes place at uh, Wake Forest. <coughs> they send us the data, we send the results back to them. And the USC Keck Medical School and the Rancho Los Amigos Rehabilitation Center in Los Angeles uh, is another uh, uh, stream of patients. Uh, and again, these are epilepsy patients and they're implanted and tested and the data is sent to us. And once we're, once we're satisfied with the, the mathematical model, and how it's implemented in these patients. Uh, the, uh, those data are sent to uh, Hong Kong, and Ray, Ray Chung uh, develops the circuits and uh, performs the initial implementation in the form of field programmable gate arrays, and then ultimately VLSI implementations of the, of the model uh, for patients to, uh, to uh, wear. Um, <coughs> I'm going to, like I said, I said, I'm going to skip a few slides to stay, uh, to stay timely, but just, I mean, you're all familiar with cochlear implants and artificial retinas, uh, and you're all familiar with uh, different types of artificial systems that have been developed uh, for, um, uh, uh, for stimulating muscles uh, to, um, uh, to, to give uh, movement back to patients that have, uh, for example, spinal cord uh, injury. But the, the kinds of uh, 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 prosthesis that, that we're developing uh, is basically dealing with a hole in the brain. And uh, we really don't have much of an idea of uh, what this group of cells that now is a whole, uh, what, did those, what did those cells do? How did they transform inputs to that group of cells? How were, how were inputs transformed by that group of cells into inputs to seed. And we have to understand that, that transformation, and we have to develop a mathematical model that allows us to predict how things in A become things in C. And so uh, th this is the pro this process, this nonlinear transformation process is one that we have to understand, and then we have to develop a model and be able to reroute uh, outputs from A as inputs to our model, and then outputs from our model as inputs to C. And really, this, this little cartoon is a very effective way of conceptualizing what we have to do. And it's very different from how we develop sensory prostheses and motor prostheses. So what are we doing with the hippocampus? This is the part of the brain that's responsible for developing new long-term memories. And it develops these memories from uh, short-term memories, from uh, object recognition, contextual cues. A lot of high-level information are the in constitute the inputs to the hippocampus. And the, this information propagates through multiple layers of the hippocampus, comes out the other end, and when it does, those are memory codes for long-term memories. So it's this process of understanding how um, uh, um, memory cues for short-term uh, memories and contextual information, uh, object recognition information. How are those uh, all those uh, cues <coughs> integrated, and how are they transformed as they uh, propagate through the layers of the hippocampus? And and uh, with the hippocampus, there are a number of conditions under which there's damage to the intrinsic pathways so that this transformation that I'm talking about doesn't take place. And so then you're familiar with a lot of these, uh, in, in particular dementia and Alzheimer's disease, uh, epilepsy, stroke, and head trauma. And all of these uh, are, are, are what, what they have in common is that they result in uh, damage to the internal structure of the hippocampus. And when that occurs, then the patients lose this ability to create new long-term memories. Their pre-existing long-term memories are just fine. Those are not altered because the, these previous, uh, previous long-term memories 
have already been, the cues have already been created, and they've already been sent to other parts of the brain for storage. So those are not influenced by these conditions. It's the ability to learn new long-term memories uh, that's altered by damage. Um, and, and so what, what's our plan? The way that we intend to, uh, to deal with this kind of a cognitive loss is to, first of all, understand this process of how uh, short-term memory changes and other information that come into the hippocampus as that information propagates through the layers of the hippocampus, how is that information transformed into cues for long-term memory? We have to understand that process if we can't do anything. And then we represent that process in the form of a, bio of a, of a biomimetic model that I, I'll call here a multi-input, multi-output model, or it's in the form of a device. And then, so that we transform uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, transformation process that used to take place with the intrinsic layers of the hippocampus, that is now performed by this multi-input, multi-output model. And then we have two uh, multi-site electrode arrays, one of them which is upstream from the damage. So those, that set of multi-electrode arrays records from uh, intact information, for example, the short-term memories that are the inputs to the hippocampus, and that information is transmitted up to the device. This device then transforms uh, short-term memory codes into long-term memory codes, and then the long-term, the newly formed long-term memory codes are transmitted through another set of multi-set electrode arrays down to the output of the hippocampus, so we drive the output of the hippocampus to the correct long-term memory code. And then that's sent to other parts of the brain for storage. So we essentially bypass the damaged parts of the hippocampus by using this whole set of, of, of electrodes and, uh, and models. So this is what uh, we've set out to do, and I'll show you at least to a certain extent we've accomplished that. Now, what are these codes I keep talking about? Uh, they're really spatiotemporal codes of pulses. Uh, neurons communicate with each other in the form of all or none uh, signals, so basically pulses. And action potential is the typical output of a neuron. <coughs> so it's, a, it's an all or none event. They have uh, common uh, amplitudes, so the amplitudes of the action potential events cannot carry information. The only thing that can carry information is the time between the action potentials, the time between pulses. So we have to, for a single neurons, we have to think in terms of information being transmitted by temporal patterns. And for any given event in the external world, uh, it's represented in the brain not by a single neuron, but by a population of neurons. So one memory is represented by we, we don't actually know, but at least hundreds and probably thousands of neurons. And, uh, and so the, the, that whole uh, set of, of, uh, of information is coded by a spatiotemporal pattern. Not just one neuron, but a set of neurons, uh, neurons in different places, so there's a, temp there's a space component with each neuron generating a different temporal pattern, so there's a time component. And so, in this case, then, if you you know, if you have different objects and events, then there are different spatial temporal patterns. And this concept here is, is really is really very important. Cognitive operation. We now can can say very concretely what a cognitive operation is. We don't have to use general terms. We can say specifically that a cognitive operation it consists of neural functions that transform spatial temporal patterns from the, the, the transform one spatial temporal pattern into a different spatial temporal pattern. So we, we've got a, a concrete definition that allows us to go into the brain and look for representations of cognitive operations. I mean we're talking about cognitive operations in the form of psychology but in, 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 the, in the form of psychology uh, we're typically talking about uh, vague terms 
uh, in the sense that we don't know what the what the, the underlying brain operation is. But if we define uh, memory codes in this way, then we can talk about not only memory codes that we can find, but we can talk about cognitive operations that change memory codes or that alter memory codes. Um, and this, this is just one, I won't deal with this too much, but this is one cross-section through the hippocampus and the, this uh, entorhinal cortex, this region here, this is where information first enters the hippocampus circuitry. Uh, so these are short-term memories and, and also contextual information, uh, information about the, uh, the shape of the environment. And this is then transport, transmitted to uh, the first component of the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus. So this is the first place where there's a transformation in the, in the code. And again, this is a highly nonlinear transformation. There's no other way to describe it. There's nothing linear about this, the form of this transformation. Dentate gyrus cells transmit the, uh, their code then to a region called CA3. So this is the second place where there's a transformation in the code. From CA3, there's a transmission to CA1. This is another place where there's a, 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 a transformation in the code. And then from CA1, there's a projection back to uh, this region called the subiculum, and then back to the entorhinal cortex, back to the rest of the brain. So information, short-term memories, have to loop through this circuit for them to become uh, long-term memories. If, if there's any uh, uh, transection of this pathway or any loss of cells, and long-term memories are, are not generated. So there are certain types of, 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 of stroke that lead to loss of this entire CA1 region. And as a consequence, patients that have that kind of acemia uh, cannot generate long-term memories. Uh, epilepsy, with the, the patients that I'll be talking about, uh, they've had long-term uh, long epilepsy uh, uh, generation. And uh, the, the epilepsies are generated within this CA3 area. And after years of, of, uh, of epilepsy, these cells die. So again, uh, once, once there's a, a long-term uh, long history of epilepsy, uh, the circuit is broken here. So the epilepsy patients that I'll be talking about, uh, they have a, a, a reduced long-term memory generation. And uh, uh, there's a, a um, excuse me, uh, blunt head trauma is uh, uh, typically leads to a, a loss of cells in this hyder region here, and that results in, in uh, a, a number of events that lead to uh, uh, not not really cell loss, but to, to malfunction of the hippocampus. So any any way in which you alter this circuit will reduce uh, long-term memory output. So we've been uh, developing this, uh, this approach to, uh, to a hippocampal prosthesis uh, over the course of many years. And we started studying uh, actually slice preparations. And then we went to behaving rats and then to behaving monkeys. And then within the last three to four years, we've been working uh, in, in humans. Let me just check time. Um? OK, thanks. Um, So let me just give you, I, I don't want to spend too much time on, on rats and monkeys because I want to get to humans, but let me just give you uh, one idea of how we've uh, developed this prosthesis for rats. What we did with rats was to give them a very simple memory problem. They, they were trained uh, to look at a wall and then uh, while they were staring at this wall, at some point uh, there was a lever that came out of the wall. It was either on the left or it was on the right. And the rat had to press that lever, and then the lever went back into the wall. And as soon as that happened, there was a, a delay period, and the rat had to turn and face the opposite wall, and the, there was a light that came on, and the rat had to stay there until the light went out. So that was a delay period to help the rat, or to at least uh, induce forgetting in the rat. And then the light went out, 
the raft turned around and faced the wall again, and both levers came out of the wall. And the, the raft had to learn to press the opposite one that he pressed front at first. And if he did, then he got a drink of water from this little, little spout. So this was a, a very simple memory uh, problem. And as this, as this delay gets longer and longer, you can see that, that this is a forgetting curve here in the blue. Forget the red. But this blue curve is a forgetting curve. So as the delay gets longer and longer, then the, the performance of the rack gets worse and worse. That's fine. Well, we had electrodes that we put up and down the length of the hippocampus, and we recorded from uh, two populations of cells, CA3 cells and CA1 cells. The CA1 cells, to remind you, these are the output cells of the hippocampus. So we recorded from these two neurons while the rats were performing this task. And as a consequence, we were able, with mathematical modeling techniques that I will not go into, we were able to identify the neural codes that were the long-term neural codes that were associated with either the left uh, uh, lever or the right lever. And this is what these codes would look like, uh, with blue being uh, low levels of activity, that is, <coughs> that is, few numbers of action potentials, and the red uh, areas uh, being high levels of activity, that is, uh, larger numbers of, of, uh, of, of uh, action potentials. So, and you can, you can see that when the, when the sample, you know, when the first uh, 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 lever comes out, when that's on the left, you have one space-time code. When it's on the right, there's a different space-time code. When the rat has to press the lever, when he comes back from that delay period, if he has to press the opposite uh, lever, and it's on the left, there's another space-time code. If he has to press the one on the right, there's a different space-time code. So we can identify the neural codes that are associated with these memories. And then what we did was to uh, have the rat perform these, these uh, tasks. And uh, while, the, while the rats were performing this task, uh, and this is the, the same kind of forgetting curve we had before, what we, what we did was to, uh, 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 we had a, a small, uh, a small tube that allowed us to enter uh, liquids uh, into the hippocampus. And what we put into that tube, uh, I won't describe the, the molecular uh, structure, but it was, a, it was a, a drug that would block one of the glutamatergic channels that existed in, in, in the hippocampus. So the, 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 the rat's hippocampus could not generate the, the long-term memory codes. So when that happened, uh, the rat was trying to form these memories, but couldn't. And when that happened, then this whole forgetting curve uh, dropped down uh, below, and, and two and, and slightly below, uh, chance levels of responding. At very short intervals where the rat could use just short-term memory, there was still above uh, uh, chance levels of, of responding. But for longer delays, uh, the rats performed at, at chance. And then, now, now we knew the long-term memory codes. The rats could not generate them, but we knew what they were. So we could induce those long-term memory codes into the hippocampus. So we used electrical stimulation techniques to, uh, to introduce the long-term memory codes that the rats could not generate. And when we did that, that forgetting curve basically went back to uh, almost to the same level uh, of control uh, that occurred before we induced uh, this uh, MK801 drug into the hippocampus. So this is just a simple example of how by discovering these memory codes and by using them, by using electrical stimulation to induce those codes into the hippocampus, we can improve long-term memory when the rats were not able to uh, generate long-term memory. Uh, we did the same kinds of things in monkeys. And I'm not going to show you those, uh, uh, those uh, similar kinds of results. I, I want to show you something else. Um, 
but, it, but we found the same results with monkeys. But with, with monkeys, you can do more interesting things. And what we had were two types, what we used were two types of trials. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the monkeys were trained to use a mouse. They sat in a chair, looked at a screen. They're actually better at using uh, a mouse with visual cues than I am. But they were, they were trained to sit in this chair, look at the screen, and move a mouse in response to uh, particular cues that showed up on the screen. One type of test they, we called an object trial, very straightforward. Um, the, 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 the monkeys uh, saw this uh, dot, when, and that indicated they had to start the trial. And so one of the, a typical sample might be something like this, where there was a brush, and the, the monkey moved the mouse over to click on the brush so we know that they saw that, and they knew they had to remember this brush. So there's a delay period again, and then we showed the monkey three, four, or five other objects, and they had to remember that they saw the brush, and they had to click on the brush. And if they, if they clicked on the brush, they got juice. Grape juice. And if they didn't get the grape juice, they would pound on the table. They, they really love grape juice. You don't get in between a monkey and their grape juice. And there was something else that we used called a space trial, a spatial trial. And that was indicated by a square. So the same kind of thing. There was a star, <coughs> and then there was a sample, and then a match. But what the, what the monkeys had to remember was not what was the cue, but where the cue was. So here they saw these gears. They had to remember uh, where those gears were. And they had, to, they had to click on this position rather than, uh, uh, and so if, if there was something different that was in this position, they had to click on that. They were not supposed to uh, pay attention to the to the object, but where the object was. And now, so I want to show you this. Um, remember, we recorded from two, three, two regions of the hippocampus. One, one early in the in the circuit. So the the long-term memory code was only partially created. And then we recorded from the CA1 region, the output of the hippocampus, where the long-term code was completely finished. All right, so. This is what, for, and again, there were two types of trials, object trials and space trials. Recordings from CA3, the, the codes that were partially created, this is what the, uh, the codes look like. There are about, I think, 18 cells here, and this is over time. Um, I don't know how many seconds. I don't have my glasses, but a certain number of seconds here. And again, blue means uh, not very much activity. Uh, yellow and red means lots of activity. So this is the code for uh, a given object uh, recorded from CA3, a partially created long-term memory. When it was a spatial trial, note that the code is different. So again, a space-time code that's partially created and on its way becoming a long-term memory. When we record from CA1, I keep talking about nonlinear transformations of the codes. This is what they look like. So here's the code for an, a given object. And at the next CA1 level, after that code has been transmitted to CA1, and the, the uh, uh, dendritic regions have summed that activity, and it's finally been uh, used to generate an action potential in CA1 cells, uh, many cells over time, this object code becomes this object code. That's the kind of nonlinear transformation I'm talking about. This is the kind of, we had to develop a model that allowed, a mathematical model that allowed us to use this as an input, and the model predicted this as the output. For the spatial time, that's the same object, but it's used in a spatial code. So this is what the CA3 region, the, the partially created the long-term memory code looks like. When it's transmitted to CA1, and now it's a full-fledged long-term memory code, this is what it looks like. Transformed from this to this. And the long-term memory code for the object, when it's an object trial, looks like this. When the same object is used to indicate space, 
long-term memory code looks like this. Okay, so these are the kinds of uh, coding schemes and signal processing that we have to deal with. And we've been able to develop uh, 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 models that allow us to make this prediction. And I can show you now what they look like. So our mathematical model had to predict this. The model using this CA3 as the input predicted this. It's almost identical to the CA1 code that we actually recorded. Here, the, this, the CA, this is the CA1 output. The mathematical model used this as the input, same object with a spatial code. We had to generate this. And, and this, so this, I'm sorry, this. <laughs> Even I get confused. So this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the code that the, that the model generated, and this was the actual uh, data that the cells generated. So the, the model that we have, and I'll show you other cases for humans, it works extremely well in being able to predict these uh, nonlinear transformations. But this just gives you a better idea of um, the difficulties that we have to deal with. Um, here, pay attention to this. Uh, these are some uh, summations of the number of action potentials over time for uh, for a space code. I want to make sure I get this right. Yes, for an object code, uh, object trials, and for uh, space trials. And you can see that the number of action potentials is vir virtually identical. So if you're just counting action potentials, you can't solve this problem. You have to look at how action potentials are distributed over time in addition to how many there are. So and most people use uh, mathematical models that basically do counting. And for these more advanced, for, for uh, uh, understanding these more advanced cognitive functions, counting action potentials is a waste of time. You have to look at how action potentials are distributed over space and over time. So let's get to humans. So in humans, again, we were, we're doing this. We have the same objective, which is to record from uh, neurons both in CA1 and in CA3. And we worked with the neurosurgeons, and they helped us develop a new entry to the hippocampus from the, uh, the <coughs> lateral surface of the brain so that we could reach the hippocampus. And this is the kind of electrode that we used uh, it had two types, it's made by AdTech, and it had two types of electrodes, one large ones that are these black bands, and they essentially record EEG-like activity, uh, some activity over many neurons. But they also have, in between these large bands, they have these uh, smaller holes, and what can come out of those holes are wires. Now, wires that are narrow, and that are, because of the higher impedance and because of the smaller size, they're able to record action potentials from single neurons. So we can look at single neuron codes. And again, because they're in different places, we can look at how those single neuron codes are distributed over space and over time. Um, anyway, so, the, so these are, this is the, uh, the CA1 region and the CA3 region. So you go through, in, the, in the, the human, you go through CA1 to get to CA3, and then cement the electrode in place. Um, so, uh, uh, well, in any event, so uh, when the, we, we had the patients come in, they were already uh, um, implanted with these electrodes. Uh, we had, um, uh, let me describe this a little bit differently. Um, uh, for, for the short-term memory task, we used uh, what were called CanTab uh, images, which are these kinds of images here. So there are four, uh, uh, each square has four quadrants, different colors, and different subsets of uh, squares <coughs> are subtracted from the, from the background. The patients look at this 
for just a, a small number of seconds, three or four seconds, and then it's taken away. And for short-term memory tests, then we have a delay period of one to 75 seconds. And then there are several of these that come back, uh, and there may be more than four, depends how, how good the patient is at this test. And the patient has to, has to pick out uh, the, uh, the, the CANTAB image that they saw previously. Uh, excuse me, I'm looking back now. So on the, on the first day, uh, we showed these kinds of CANTAB images to the patients, and we recorded the activity in both CA3 and CA1. And the data was then sent to us. And overnight or the next day, we used the mathematical model to understand how uh, these different images were transmitted from CA3 to CA1. It, we basically tried to use the CA3 data uh, as inputs to the model to be able to predict CA1. So the next day, uh, or maybe the next couple of days when the patients came back, we'd show them the same images we'd record from uh, the CA3 region. That, then that would be the input to our model, and the model would predict what CA1 should look like. What should the multi-input, multi-output uh, activity uh, look like in CA1? And we made a prediction. And then that uh, prediction was used to electrically stimulate the output of the hippocampus. Um, so, and the, uh, I won't go through the, uh, the explanation of the model, and in fact, uh, to make sure I stay on time, I'm going to skip this. But there is a whole modeling procedure uh, that is really cool, uh, but I won't go through it. So this then was our, our uh, uh, <coughs> CAN-TAB test again. So, again, the, the, uh, the goal that we had was to use the, the, the CA3 activity that we recorded from the patient, use that as the input to the model, and then uh, predict what the activity in CA1 should look like. And this just shows you an example of what, how well the model predicts the CA1 activity. Uh, for a given patient. So here, this is what was actually reported from a patient. So the multiple is up to about 50 neurons, and this is over uh, many seconds. And what this is showing are trials. So this is when uh, uh, one of those CANTAB images was shown to the patient. This is when the patient uh, used his, his finger to touch the image. Uh, this is when the set of images came back. And this is when the patient made a guess as to which one he saw before. So that, these are various trials like that over in time. And you can see that as these trials occur, activity is heightened here. Again, blue means very little activity. Red means lots of activity. So some cells are not active. They're not participating in this. But there are other cells that are very much engaged by this task and that are clearly showing the existence of the long-term memory codes. So this is what the uh, what we actually recorded from CA1. This is what our model predicted. So it's again, it's a really terrific. It's a virtual identification of the uh, previously recorded activity from from CA1. This is another example of how well the model can predict. This is the actual CA3 space-time activity, this is how well the model predicts that space-time activity. So if, if we use these data to generate electrical simulation codes in the hippocampus, we know we're going to be able to duplicate this uh, long-term memory code very well. Now, these long-term memory codes are long-term memory codes from, uh, from epilepsy patients. Why are we using epilepsy patients? Because they don't form long-term memory codes very well. So what's the point in uh, uh, having perfect identity with, with, uh, with an epilepsy uh, brain when what you want to do is improve the epilepsy brain? So we develop an improved uh, set of codes in the following way. 
One is by using electrical stimulation. When the patients are generating the, the, their best long-term memory code, there's a little bit of activity, but not lots of activity. So when we add electrical stimulation to what the patients are generating, we're boosting the signal in, in the brain. The second thing that we do is generate what we call a correct code. Here, when we, when we go to finally perform the, the final uh, model, uh, we only use the trials in which uh, the patients are correct. So trials when the patients are incorrect, by definition that means that the code is wrong, or there's going to be something wrong with the code. So we don't use those trials when we generate the final, the final output for, uh, for stimulating uh, uh, the brain. Okay, so uh, we use this corrected code MIMO model, and by doing that, uh, we can enhance uh, we can enhance the behavior uh, of the of the patients because we're enhancing the uh, the viability of the long term memory code. So, what how does this work? Um, these bars show uh, what things how the patients perform when there's no stimulation at all. These green bars show how the patients perform uh, when we stimulate with the long-term memory code for the object they're looking at. Remember, each one of these can have images has its own code because it's a, it's a different um, uh, object. So there's a different representation in the brain of that object. So when we're showing these objects to the, to the patients, we electrically stimulate with a specific long-term memory code for that object. And uh, to make sure that this space-time coding is really important, we also we have other trials where we, uh, we stimulate randomly with a random sequence of, uh, of electrical pulses, the same density of pulses, but uh, pulses for uh, uh, pulses that don't have the code for the object, and the, so, and basically, you can see here that, that the green bars are larger than all the other bars, and so when we electrically stimulate with the uh, long-term memory code for the objects in question, um, the patients do better, and the average is, is shown here. So, no stimulation is enhanced by about 25 percent uh, when we stimulate with the. Uh, with the long with the long term memory code, and then here uh, with random activity. Um, so we, we have a basically a similar kind of trial that we use for testing long term memory, and uh, and which, and what we the delays in this case are uh, fifteen to forty five minutes uh, rather than seconds, and essentially we get we get the same results. All right. So when we don't stimulate. At all, the patients can perform about at 50% or 60%. When we stimulate with uh, the code for the objects, uh, we enhance that by another uh, 30%. And then if we stimulate randomly, there's basically no, no difference. So we can improve uh, epilepsy uh, memory performance considerably uh, by using this, this approach. We're working on something else called the memory decoding model, and I'll uh, go over this quickly. Um, what would okay. uh, sure? So, uh, if I understood correctly, correctly uh, these are independent of the individual. I mean, the, the kind of codes you have to have are universal; they, they do not depend on the particular individual that you're studying. Though they are no, no, no. Oh. They are dependent on the individual. Okay. okay. Each of each of these codes is specific for right. for the patient. Okay. And there are specific for the object as well. Specific. I'm sorry. For the kind of object that we are yes. developing. Yes. That's right. And yes. how do they depend on the pharmacological regime that the, the patient might be under? I mean. Uh, yeah. Well, we haven't studied that. Yeah. We have That's a, it's a good point. But we we haven't looked at that at all. So that may be a factor that we've got to go into, but we haven't done it yet. Very good. Um, 
Yeah, sure. No, I'll, I'll go quickly. Do you want me to finish now? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, the uh, work is working on something called a memory decoding model. In, the, in these previous data, you can imagine what we have is uh, in, the, in the hippocampus, there are many neurons that are engaged uh, by this object. And so there's a there's a, 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 a population of cells that are generating action potentials over time, and some of those uh, action potentials are uh, incorrect in the sense that they're not representing the long-term memory code well, or maybe they're missing, maybe they're not there at all. And so what we're doing with our stimulation is replacing either the timing of those things, or we're replacing the cells that might be missing. But we have no idea what's represented by this space-time code. We just know that it's there, or it needs to be there. And it needs to be there in a particular space in a particular time. What we'd like to be able to do is to read this sequence of action potentials and be able to say that, oh, look at this. The patient is thinking about his mother. You know. What is the representation what does it represent? What is the, uh, the content of the memory? And this is the kind of thing that, I mean, this is what we really have to deal with. A uh, series of action potentials in CA3, a series of action potentials in CA1 that's generated by the MIMO model. And as time goes by, you know, this, this kind of transformation is taking place. <laughs> But we don't know what we don't know how to read this, and what's represented in this time. There may be one object that's represented at one particular place, another object represented at another particular place, etc. And so we're developing ways of of uh, studying the uh, the the, uh, the integration or the the uh, uh, temporal collection of action potentials in the face of certain classes uh, of, um, of objects. So for example, the, um, uh, we, we, we're testing to see when we uh, present pictures of animals, is there a common collection of action potentials? Is there a code uh, for uh, animal? Is there a code for plant? And we're finding out that yes, there is, and in fact, we can uh, we can identify these uh, these collections of action potentials that represent uh, uh, classification. So I won't go through this, um, but there are some new modeling methods that uh, we've developed that have to do with uh, multi-resolution piece lines and bagging and stacking procedures that allow us to, uh, to represent these uh, classifications. Exist. So we're on the way, on the way to doing that. Um, just to get the hardware, uh, Ray Chung's group has, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, has designed a field programmable gate array layout for a 64 input gate output uh, MIMO model that works uh, really well. Uh, he's also uh, set that for, uh, for a VLSI design. Uh, that has now been fabricated and, and tested, and it's a, it uses a 40 nanometer technology, uh, has a very nice uh, uh, power consumption that's reasonable, and uh, we're working on a, on a, a larger uh, output uh, model uh, so that we can use this for a larger number of, of um, MIMO models, but we're working our way toward this. And, uh, we're, we're in discussion with uh, Dean Markovich's group at UCLA. They have a, a set of, of hardware uh, boards that can handle 64 to 256 channels of action potentials. So if we have a whole set of, of, um, of electrodes that are recording from hundreds of neurons, his uh, set of boards uh, can handle the collection and the uh, uh, initial generation of uh, uh, initial signal processing of those action potentials. We can attach one more board for our MIMO model, and the whole thing will fit into the palm of the hand. 
I will skip this and just say we need to thank our support, which in large part came from DARPA, but also from uh, Elon Musk and uh, NIDIB. It's been really important in uh, helping us with the biomic, with, 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 the, with the modeling. Most of the modeling was developed under the auspices of uh, NIDIB. So thank you. Thank you. This is approved.